366. Sing all four verses, 366. Is it for me to sing, Lord, thy glory and thy rest? For me so weak and sinful, oh, shall I be so? Oh, 
63 with the invitation. For those of you who are regular uh, students here, we are in this book on Lesson 14, Chimney Corner Scripture. Uh, this is just an individual sheet of tonight's lesson. Uh, if you need, if you don't have one, why well, raise your hand, and I will see to it that you, you get one. Uh, everybody, evidently, everybody has one. We want to look at this uh, lesson tonight on the chimney corner scripture. Uh, and if you look at the first paragraph, the last phrase says, uh, "A friend in need is a friend indeed." And I pointed out that only sounds like it's from the Scriptures. And so the initial statement was made in the 3rd century B.C. Uh, it was written in Latin by uh, Quintus uh, Ennius. He says, A sure friend is known when in difficulty. The Oxford Dictionary of Quotations lists the statement as being in English from the 11th century. And debates continue as to the time of origin concerning the, the phrase. Its meaning, however, is basically that a friend... When you are in need, is someone who is prepared to prove their friendship by their deeds. It also may be reciprocal. That is, they help you, you help them. Even though a friend in need is a friend indeed is not actually from the Bible, the concept certainly is found there. Moses wrote in Deuteronomy 15, 8, But thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanteth. The physician Luke recorded in Acts 2, verse 45, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Uh, this sentiment is repeated by the same author in Acts 4, verse 35, and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. The apostle John wrote of this adage by saying in 1 John three seventeen, But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Ask yourself, am I, in my life, practicing the sentiment of this thought? Do I close myself off to others' needs? Or do I express my concern and compassion by actually helping and doing that which is constructive to assist them? Perhaps the best example of a friend in need is a friend indeed is penned in Romans 16 and verse 2. A woman by the name of Phoebe, a Christian, had helped many friends. Uh, she is remembered in Annals of Divine History for practicing the theory behind our studied phrase today. The scripture says of her that ye receive her in the Lord as become a saints, and, the assist, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succorer of many and of myself also. One final thought comes from Proverbs 18.24 and Matthew 7.12. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And do unto others as you would have them do unto you. These words of King Solomon's wisdom, coupled with an application of Jesus' golden rule, should help us all to practice the meanings of words and phrases involving friendship. Sitting around the warm chimney, talking with your family and friends, try practicing a friend in need is a friend indeed. And so we're looking tonight at the subject of friendship. And before we get into the passages there on the screen. And again, those are there for uh, those who might be live streaming or those of you who want to take uh, extra notes uh, studying about the, the various aspects of, of all of this. Uh, I've already mentioned some of the first ones there, uh, Deuteronomy 15 and Acts 2 and 1 John 3, and some of the others were in this uh, article that I just read. And so I'm going, I'm, my part, I'm going to stop there and open it up for a discussion. Any of those scriptures that you want to uh, look at again or make comments on uh, before we go into the rest of them. Matthew 7 12. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, whatever you, uh, what men to do to you, you know, uh, 
to the there. Matthew seven twelve, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The golden right. rule. Yeah. Hard thing. Yeah. Not always easy. You know what? You know what's the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of leave me thinking about it. You know, that's that's something. Yeah. Talking about practice. And, you know, this here at the end of the thing. That's that's a good one to practice. Better. That's true. It is a hard a hard saying, so to speak. Hard practice. Thinking of Jesus teaching in the Sermon on the Mount where he talks about uh, if a person, uh, how, how is it worded where you are to turn the other cheek? And, uh, you know, sometimes that's not easy to do. If they persecute you or say all manners of evil against you, um, if they do bad things to you, uh, help them out, uh, kill them with kindness, we might say today is a cliche that might be used. All those thoughts. Anyone else have any? Yes, that was the one I was trying to think of too. I couldn't think of that one. If you ask for your coat, yeah. Uh, James, the, the first chapter, or the, uh, the second chapter, James, the second chapter, talks about one who comes into your assembly and, you know, you show partiality and maybe they're in need and you just uh, pat them on the back or on the shoulder and say, be ye warm to the field and send them on their way and don't do anything to help them. So James condemns that attitude as well. We need to try to everything, do everything we possibly can to uh, initiate friendship with people. Uh, there, there are a number of folks that I just don't like, uh, and, and that's just because I'm a human being. And I'm sure that you're all honest. You would say the same thing. Uh, the, you know, the, the old idea is, concept is, that I don't have to like everybody, but I do have to love them. And they've got a soul, and I love that soul. And so we have to love everybody, but we don't have to like them. And so there's just a whole lot of people out here that I just don't like what they do. I don't like the way they talk. I don't like the way they act. I don't like the decisions that they make, and supposedly in my behalf. Um, and, you know, just that list would go on and on. But whatever I can do, uh, Romans chapter 12 says, as much as within in, in me possible, live at peace with all men. I think that's verse 19 of Romans 12 but um, that you know that that's a hard time I haven't talked about a hard thing to do that golden rule uh, it applies in a number of those situations uh, Jeff Everything's perfect, and we don't want people to see our weaknesses. But our true friends should we should be able to communicate those things. Yes. To them. Long before computers and Facebook were used to say we don't air our laundry, dirty laundry in the public, and that's the same thing. You can only do so much with Facebook and computers. <laughs> and you said make yourself beautiful. Uh, you can only do so much. <laughs> But I understand what you're saying. That whatever we can do, whatever's possible, the Lord expects us to do. Bob? You... One thing that bothers me about this phrase is the, I guess my math background, when you see the word is in something, that usually means the first part is equal to the second part. And when you see this and it says a friend in need equals a friend in deed, that doesn't always fit, I don't think. Okay. Because sometimes... You think that they're in need, you try to help them out, and they'll 
hurt against you, or they'll ignore you, or they'll take advantage of you, or something. Yeah. So you know, this this kind of bothers me. But if it is a friend in need, you know, and you can try to help them out. But this doesn't say anybody in need is a friend in need. And I think that's where society now is, is headed. To this. You know, we're going to try to help out everybody, and then they're all going to be our friends in the end. Yeah. Well, I don't think that's going to be the case. Right. right. <coughs> Jesus said, the poor you always have with you. I mean, you can't deny that. Yes, what you're saying is, and I understand the word is, there is an equality there on both sides of the fence. Uh, so you, you know, you both of you have maybe not on the same page with everything, with every detail, but certainly there would be an attitude on both sides that I am going to give you help, and you in turn will give me help. And that, again, that's the golden rule application of it. That there has to be a, an attitude of both sides, and, and as you said, an equality between those two parties. Somebody else had it. Yeah, Ivan, uh, you had. Oh, yeah. uh, well, I'm just thinking that, that you know we can go back to the, the scripture that tells us you you do to men the way you want to be treated, and for we know what he meant by that. You nobody wants to be treated bad, and uh, so you have got to keep that mind. And you brought up a good point. When you're dealing with people, nobody's perfect. You're going to have bad times. You might you might even treat somebody bad. Maybe you're sorry for it later. Like Bob said, you might try to help somebody and they just fuck you off. Right. You know, give, give you a hard time about it or whatever. And that's the case, then you have to leave alone. But at least try, you know, and you keep, and you keep that attitude. And that, that's another attitude or hard thing for people. a lot of people to do is they don't know how to receive help. Uh, this is a big problem with so many people I see in the world. Uh, we're, we've all become so independent, somebody mentioned this while ago, that we don't feel like we have any need from anybody else and, and I can take care of this problem myself. And so if you want to help them, they feel like that you're nosing into their business and they just don't, it's like giving a gift. You know, I, a lot of people just don't know how to receive a gift gracefully and graciously. Uh, they they just don't know how. It's a, a stumbling block for them. So this whole thing with friendship, as we said, it deals uh, primarily with our attitude on both sides of the fence. Yeah, Kevin? Okay. Well, I think the point of, that Bob brought up, that a friend who starts out as a friend, and then many times we have people that, again, I'm choosing to refrigerate, give them an inch and they'll take a mile. Uh, yes. say, yeah, those aren't friends, those are people trying to take advantage right. of And I think that's, that's important to, but today, in today's society, we, we don't trust anybody. Phone calls, and everything. We don't trust anybody. Right. You gotta, uh, you gotta know who you're dealing with. It's and it's terrible. I, I'm that way so much. I, you know, I get calls from Anthem all the time, and I just hang up on them because I say I don't deal with insurance until I talk to my wife. But, and maybe I shouldn't be that way. I don't know. But I, as you said, I've just got to where I don't trust anybody. I don't. I'm, I mean, it's, it's especially if somebody calls me on the phone. It's a scam, and I, I just put up a whole fence there uh, between me and the rest of the John Q. public and I shouldn't be that way uh, but you know I've always said that respect is something that you earn and so for me to respect a person they have to earn that respect and I in turn have to earn their respect and I you know don't misunderstand I'm not saying I'm going to hang up on you to call me <laughs> I'm just saying that you know it gets to the point where you just you build up this defense and in independency <coughs> And you say, hey, I'll take care of this problem myself, or in my case, shove it off on my wife. Uh, she'll take care of it. But, uh, you know, I, the whole society is that way. Anyone else? I was thinking, Gary, on the, on the friend order, you know, did you ever talk about that stuff? You know, a friend, they'll talk to each other. And I know they were giving him bad advice, but, but it started out, I think, as a, as a good thing to Joe when, he, when his friends come and talk to him. You know, they, they were wanting to talk to anybody's problem. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, 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 a good, it's a good thing to have. For, you know, that did that up real good. But, but I think they started out probably in a hurry. Yeah. Well, that's, a, you know, just a good example of what, you know, being there for your friend if, if that's what they did. Yeah. Okay.
take you long to find out what they are. Yeah, that's true. Unless you're naive and gullible as I am, and then everybody deceives me. You know, I, I have this tendency to, uh, as I said, I, I, I build up this wall, this defense. And on the other hand, I, what anybody tells me, I want to believe. And I, I've kind of got to the point where I don't even do that anymore. Everybody's suspect. And, and again, not with Christians. I don't mean that. It's just people in the world. And that's back to Bob's point about friend, a friend. Not talking about just about anybody. And that's what I'm talking about. A friend. So if it's a brother or sister in Christ, I have no problems with treating them with respect. Uh, and hoping that they would treat me with the same respect. And all that. So, as you said, it doesn't take long to figure out uh, who's shallow and uh, who is, uh, has some depth to them as far as appreciation and, and genuinely wanting to help is concerned. Uh, I, I like the, the phrase here, uh, since first one mentioned it there, Deuteronomy 15 and verse 8, notice, open thine hand wide unto him. Uh, you can't help but think of, about a handshake, uh, putting your extending your hand out to a person, and this one tells explains from your heart. Just open up your heart. Just put your whole heart out there. Open wide your hand. Uh, don't, don't say, "Well, I'm going to help you with clenched fist." Clenched uh, <laughs> fist. You know, I said, "I've got I got a gift in here for you." But you're going to have to take away from get it out of my hand. Uh, that's not what Moses is saying here. He said, "You got a gift to help with other people." He said, "Open up your hand, freely give it." As I said, from the heart. And that, that's why I like this Deuteronomy 15 verse eight. Uh, and and I think another thing is implied in this is that second clause: uh, lend him sufficient for his need. You don't have to go over, overboard. You know, sometimes I think we, at least I, this thought has crossed my mind, I'm sure it has yours too, but how much do you give? How much do you help another person? Uh, to the extent that you maybe hinder your own lifestyle or the way that you uh, are able to go about your everyday affairs, uh, we are supposed to help people uh, sufficiently and uh for those needs. So it's not that I would go overboard and say, well, you've got a thousand dollar a month payment on your house, I'll just take that over. Uh, that, that's not what he's saying. Whatever is sufficient, you know, if, if you've been, you, you help a person, but you don't pay all the bills for them, uh, unless there's some dire circumstance that can't be overcome. But uh, anyway, that's just another lesson I got from this Deuteronomy 15 verse 8. Yeah, Bob? One thing I noticed from most of these scriptures that you've got listed here on the on the page are talking about brothers, brothers and saints and, and yes. fellow Christians or fellow Israelites is what it's talking about here. Yeah. Because in that Deuteronomy, it starts out the verse before that saying, There's among you four of your brother. And it says, Lend him, you know. And I noticed I, I was kind of surprised at that word lend him. You know, it doesn't say give him. What you need, lend them what you need. Yes. It's a good point. And, and as, as you said, all these are done, right? And, and isn't that the way it should be? I mean, we talk about Christians as being the family of God. And the old phrase is, you'll do anything for your family. Well, that's the way our attitude should be in this friendship. If you're a brother or sister in Christ, there's hardly anything I wouldn't do for you or you wouldn't do for me. And that's what he's getting across here is, is these are brethren. Uh, then we need to have this this attitude of helping them. And again, as Bob said, it's not everybody out here in the world. And I <clears throat> stated a while ago when you, you get some uh, telemarketer or somebody, I, that's not why I guess I'm a little antagonistic toward them because they're not Christians as far as I know. They're not brothers or sisters in Christ. And there's somebody that's wanting something from me. Uh, and it may be a good deal, but not until you prove yourself in your own integrity uh, can I build confidence and have respect for you. But when it's a brother or sister in Christ, it's the family ties, it's the bond. Uh, blessed be the ties that bind. That's the hymn that we sing. And so it's Christ Himself that binds us together. We are we are brothers and sisters with Christ. He is our elder brother, so to speak. As God is our Father. 
And so we understand this family unit, this family relationship. Yes. I see it as so much of the time we we are so self-centered ourselves, our own games. You have a good lesson on that here a while back, but uh, it's not that we don't have to work with. We just don't want to take the time. Uh, we see the need. We we know how to help them, but we just don't do it. And sometimes we don't want to get involved. Is their, our attitude is, you know, well, it's their problem, and I could help them, but we just don't, like you said. <coughs> That's an issue. I'm gonna look at this uh, Proverbs 22 uh, 24. To me, that was a pretty interesting verse. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and it goes along with, you know, it says, do good to all of wherever possible. You know, I think it was that Galatians the word that says that. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's limits that, that other people force you to be in. You know, and there's, and there's not, not much you can do about it. So all I can do is go about what the Word of God is there to follow it. And I think there's a good lesson in that right here. Yep. Make, make no friendship with an angry man and with a furious man. Don't go. I mean, you got, you got to be wise with what you do. Yep. If you can help him, yes. But if you can't, then, yep. you know, you have to do what's right. And, For, and, uh, and that's backed up by 1 Corinthians 15.33. Where it's 34. We're spending 1533 about choosing our friends wisely. You know, you well, have to, right, which the next verse here is perfect for that. I mean, that you hit that right on the nail is verse 26 uh, or, or verse 25. Let's you learn his ways and, and, and get yourself in a snicker. Yes. And, uh, you know, and so there's a reason for this. That don't be going along with what they're doing, trying to be friends with them if they're doing wrong. Right. Peaked my inner here. I got to look that up. Do not be deceived. Yeah, first Corinthians fifteen thirty three. Evil company corrupts good habits. That's New King James Version. Anyone else? Kevin? I think what you brought up before, JC, the attitude. I think is a, is a key here. Uh, you know, do I have to worship God? You know, do or, or, or do I want to? And I think that that is a big point. Part of all of this. Cultivate your mind to wanting to do it, not because I have to. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that, that applies to a lot of our spiritual life. And how many times do people say, if not out loud, at least in their minds, I have no better friend than God. I have no better friend than Jesus Christ. I have no better friend than the Holy Spirit. You know, and so, because of that intimacy, because of that relationship, uh, our attitude is not that I have to, but I, I appreciate the love, the compassion, the grace, and the mercy uh, that God extends to me. And that's it's not it's an attitude that I, I am to have. Not because just I have to, but because I want to. And as I said, while we go about family, uh, hardly anything we wouldn't do for our family. There's a <clears throat> I think uh, not to get off on a doctrinal tangent or anything but this Acts 4.35 here in the article and laid them down at the apostles feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need the reason I said the doctrinal issue is because we have a lot of brethren in churches of Christ that uh, take money from the treasury and try to help community projects and, and you know it's a they say the end justifies the means. And yet this passage is one that is oftentimes used by them saying, well, see, now we're supposed to help everybody. But when he's talking about this in Acts 4.35, he's talking about unto every man according as he had need. In that text, he's talking about the bread, not every man in the community or every man in the world. And that's back to what somebody, Bob, I think, was saying earlier. about Some people have the idea that the more money you pour into it, that that's just going to resolve all the problems. And money is not always the answer. And especially when you're dealing with authority from the scriptures as to what you can use the church treasury for and what you can't. Uh, this passage does not justify or authorize taking money from the treasury and giving it to every man as far as John Q. Public is concerned. It's limited uh, in the necessary inference uh, authoritative way here 
uh, to just those that are members of the body of Christ. I know there are passages that are dealt with and battled over as far as uh, some brethren are concerned and have been down through the decades, uh, basically ever since the Christian church split off and they started the Missionary Society. I was talking to some about this Sunday uh, in the early eight or middle 1800s. And then you get into sponsoring church arrangement and pooling all your funds and that funds and all that stuff and saying the unjustified means well we are to help our own and we are to uh, Galatians 6 at verse 10 we individually are to do good to all men that is out in the world but that's an individual responsibility and especially to those in the household of the faith so even individual responsibility the, the church's treasury is not a set up as a fund to feed the world you, you think that when you talk about some kind of religious organization, usually they're labeled as a church, uh, that that's one of their primary functions is to feed the world. And you get into all these denominations, that's exactly what uh, one of the things that they do in, in functioning uh, in that capacity. But the church treasury is limited as far as benevolence is concerned. But as an individual Christian, Galatians 6.10 says, I am to help all men. And especially those who are Christians, those in the household of faith. So I do have responsibility. That's why if I have opportunity and I have the uh, funds available, I can go out and I can help the Cancer Society or the Boy Scouts or some group that is trying to, to better the community. And I can give from my own pocket. Uh, I, and I guess I don't mean to get on a soapbox, but I get that so much of the time of people stopping by the building here and wanting a handout. And they think all I have to do is just take it out of the church treasury and give it to them. And I, they just don't understand as many times as I've tried to explain it. I said, if I help you, it's coming out of my own pocket. Now, I, I don't say that every time, depending on the circumstances, you understand that. But uh, people knock on the door and they just their attitude is, well, you got plenty of money in your, in your coffers, in your church treasury, uh, and you give me $100, you just get it back from the church. No, I don't. Uh, it's an individual matter. And so I, I just mentioned this in passing because we want to we want to be friends with everybody. And I want to not buy friendship necessarily, but I do want to help all men as much as I can. But I'm, I'm not paid back by the church for whatever I do as an individual. Uh, and so that, that's just a, a concept that's formed to a lot of people's thinking. And when we... We looked at this uh, Acts 4.35 and that, that phrase was made into, a distribution was made into every man according as he had need. That specifically in that context is talking about bread and all men. Well, enough about that. And any other passage you want to mention? i got a couple here that I just talked about. Any others you want to look at? 1 John 3.17 or Romans 16, Matthew, Proverbs 18. You've talked about it before, but it does say need. It don't say wants. Good point. Good point. Yes. <coughs> yeah. Not their needs. Somebody self finds says, I'd like to have a new car. Can you buy me one? <coughs> well, I would too. I mean, I was, you know, I'm driving a 2010 car. Uh, and it's good shape. It looks good. It looks new. It looks like it came off showroom floor. But it's 11 years old. I like to have a brand spanking new one. You know, good thing. And it's using exaggeration, what we call hyperbole, uh, to manifest a point to kind of uh, blow it out of proportion. But yeah, anything, not just a matter of want, uh, but our needs. Uh, kind of along with that, it's their need, it's not what we think they need. That's true. Sometimes we kind of overstep our boundaries and by deciding what they need in our sight and our standards. It may not be what they need. It may not be what, what they want either. Yeah. Hey, good point. Like a lot of these guys that are standing on the road, they say they want money. You give offer them a job or something. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, from what I've heard, just gossip, but they really make more money. Oh yeah, that's what I hear. Doing that and, and going to work. 
You know, that's that's a shame. Again, it's kind of the same commentary on our society. But it's a shame that we kind of lump all those people together. There are genuinely homeless people that need help. Not denying that. But what we're seeing, by and large, most of them are freeloaders. And they'll take you for however much you can give them. And I know young people a lot of times have have trouble discerning, distinguishing this. Adults do too. But I'm thinking of uh, particular instances with some of our grandchildren. They, they always want to help some homeless person on the street, you know, and, and that's, that's a commendable attitude to have, uh, that you want to help somebody else. But you also have to be conscious of that. Can't buy friendship. On Sunday, we were going to Linton, and there was a guy sitting along the edge of the road down there toward the east side of town on his nice zero turn lawnmower <laughs> with his little cardboard sign. Yeah. I told Brad Luke, what he needs to do is take that zero turn lawnmower and find some lawns to buy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, all the, there's all kinds of. You'll love Linton. Uh, did you love Linton when you got this? <laughs> Yeah, we could go on and on about situations. I, I remember our daughter talking about Dollar General in, in uh, Gosport, a lady in a brand new Lincoln. What is that? Es Escalator? And that's, that's the Cadillac thing. What's the, what's the Lincoln? Navigator. Navigator. Brand new one's big, brand new. And I mean, it was brand new. And went in and paid for her stuff at Dollar General with food stamps. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, we all know those stories. We, we hear that. But Tabitha happened to be right behind her and uh, saw how, what she drove up in and what she drove out in. <laughs> and it wasn't a rental car, it was, you know, I had a license, it was early. Yeah, uh, people abuse the system. And we all are aware of that. And, and a lot of people are genuinely <laughs> in need, and we need to help those that we can. But sometimes it's, it's hard to make the proper distinction. Well, uh, any other ones that we've got there that. Um, I don't think we mentioned Job chapter 29 or verse 4 yet. Uh, as I was in the ripeness of my days when the friendship of God was upon my tent. What does that mean? Job. What would the ripeness of your days be? It'd be the mature years, wouldn't it? Be the older days or last days, and when God is kind of there waiting for you to go home. Uh, so that was that was Job, and that's why kind of where I was coming from a while ago when I talked about we don't have a better friend than God, or Christ, or the Holy Spirit, and that's why Job was saying when the friendship of God was upon my tent. And, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of people get to that point where they spend an entire lifetime. Uh, not thinking about God until He's uh, over their tent, waiting for them to, to go home to leave this earth, and then they want a friend. Well, all these people we talk about Job. Well, they call him them all friends, but you read, you read it, and they're not his friends. Yeah, right. Yeah, Nadab and uh, or Bildad, Zophar, and. You like it? No. You like who was the fourth one? The three. What? You like that? Like yes. Yeah. Yeah. They were uh, supposed our alleged friends, and, and we all have dealt with those too. Uh, supposed friends that uh, don't follow through. Yes. I was thinking along that line. You talked about the guys sitting around, you know, on the side of the road with the sign. Uh, you know, in the first place, I don't like very many of them. Any of them probably don't know anybody that has any self worth about them that's not at least trying to find a job rather than running out begging like that. Mm -hmm. and, that and that reminded me of, you know, man should work, should be. I think I, I, I know that's not a chimney for I know it's there. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I looked it up and that's a theft only of uh, 310. If anyone's uh, not working, either should eat. Uh, see, 310? Yeah, second best line is 310. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Uh, for even if we were with, uh, when we were with you, uh, we commanded you this: if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Or if he goes on to, to explain why, 
You know, there's also other scriptures that talks about, you know, to, to help widows or, or anybody, but not to the point where they have so much out of time on their hands that they're just, they don't deserve what they got. In other words, if they can do it for self, do it yourself. Right. And so I think that's the idea on, on that kind of thing, anyway. Right. You know, help somebody if they need help. Uh, the next one down is uh, Psalms 25, 14. The friendship of Jehovah, which is the same thing we're talking about in Job 29, is with them that fear him, that is, have respect for him, uh, and he will show them his covenant. So God's uh, laws are available to us all, and he will, the laws will be opened up, his covenant will be opened up to you for your understanding, because he is your friend. Uh, Proverbs 3, 32, for the perverse it's an abomination to Jehovah, but his friendship is with the upright. And so again, being a righteous individual, God is your best friend. That's kind of what all these have to do. Uh, we've already read the, the Proverbs 22 at uh, verse 14. Uh, the, the last few uh, from Proverbs 2 at verse 17, that forsakes the friend of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. And so when we we're young, we talked about a while ago, the rightness of my days, Job talks about. Here, uh, Solomon talks about that forsakes the friend of her youth and uh, forgets the covenant of her God. So that's possible. This is why Solomon also says Ecclesiastes uh, 12 and verse 1, Remember now thy creator in the days of your youth. You, you teach this to young people about God uh, so that they'll remember him all the days of their life. Uh, Proverbs 17, at verse 17, a friend loves at all times. A brother is born of adversity. Proverbs 18, 24, he that makes many friends doeth it to his own destruction, but there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs 19, 4, wealth adds many friends, but the poor is separated from his friend. Proverbs 19, 6, many will entreat the favor of the liberal man, and every man is a friend to him that gives gifts. Proverbs 22, at verse 11, he that loves pureness of heart for the grace of his lips, the king will be his friend. Uh, Proverbs 27 of 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are profuse. Uh, verse 9 of that same chapter. Oil and perfume rejoice in the heart, so does the sweetness of a man's friend that comes of hearty counsel. And this goes on for uh, three more verses 10 and 14, uh, 9, 10 and 14 and 17, all basically saying, the same thing. Uh, we've got about five or six minutes left. Is there anything that, um, before I go ahead talking, I just read those very quickly. Or any any one there of those verses that you want to comment on or ask about? That takes us down to James four, and we're going to use that a little bit as an invitation for tonight. So I won't get quite to that yet. I like this one in Proverbs 22, 27, 17. Iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. What does that mean? So many people, iron sharpens iron. Nobody's ever sharpened a tool? Jane? A friend will help you be the best person you can be. All right. A friend will help you be the best person you can be. Keeps you sharp. You may have tendencies one way or another that may take you away. A friend will bring you back, will sharpen you up uh, so that you will, will be a better person rather than let you go off and get dull and rusty. I, I'm thinking, I, I don't know if that's actually being that context, but I'm thinking that maybe uh, sometimes that would mean it takes something hard to make you a better person. And you may not like it at first, so it'll be a little tough edge on it. Yeah. Yeah, that's not always easy that iron sharpens iron. You know, you ever tried to sharpen a chainsaw chain? Oh, well, those are hard to do. You have to have a rat tail file and then you have to go the right direction and then you have to put the chain back on the right direction. You got another <laughs> angle. Our one of our grandsons is a farrier and uh, he has an anvil and puts shoes on the horses and all that. And he, he does a lot with this uh, as far as as far as the iron is concerned, the anvil and the hammer and, and all that. And that is, is just kind of fresh on the mind. And Landon, who comes to church services here from time to time. But anyway, uh, 
he's a farrier, and uh, so that, that's why I said this kind of appreciate that that verse that Solomon is mentioning. Um, any of the others you want to mention? That was just a James four four. Uh, and there again, there's a, there's a fine point there. But sometimes friendship is not a good thing in, in certain ways. Uh, here he's, he's talking about people, you know, sin. But basically, here the idea of friendship with the world is enmity with God. And so you have to, you know, if, if you have to choose, you better choose the right one. That's true. Okay. Um, yeah, if, if you don't care. Here's a, an article I want you to take home with you. But Mike Davis wrote this, and if you have his website or uh, Facebook or whatever, it was on there. Uh, he sent it to me in, a, in email, and it's kind of, I might read it. And I thought it was good enough. I just share it. Since we we're talking on friendship tonight, that's what the, the theme of this article is. And about everybody here knows Mike, preaches down the leaves, we help support him. And so. Uh, I mentioned I was going to pass it out tonight. And he said, well, you're, you're too good a friend. And, <laughs> and I said, well, uh, be that as it may, I said, I, I thought the material was good. So I, I just thought it kind of fit in with tonight's uh, lesson on friendship. So you can just take it home with you. There's no test over it. You can throw it away when you get done or keep it forever. But <laughs> uh, I just want to share that with you from mine. Anything else on any of these scriptures that anybody wants to mention? We've got about two minutes left. Gary? Yes? In Proverbs 3, verse 27, uh -huh. I like what it says. It says, Withhold not good from them to whom it is due, when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. You know, help those. If you can help somebody, yep. do it. Good point. I think it is James... That may be in James 4 too. I'm not sure. Is, is that where the, the sin of omission is as great as the sin of commission? Does anybody remember that? Is that James 4? Uh, if, if you know to do good and don't do it, it's sin. And so here's an opportunity you're talking about to take advantage of that opportunity. And as much as, like the Romans 12, 19, I mentioned earlier, as much as within you possible live with peace with all men, well, as much as within you possible take advantage of opportunities to help. Well, that's a good point. I just thought that out. Anyone else? Thank you. Okay, next week, the Lord's willing, we'll be talking about practice what you preach from Lesson 15, and we encourage you to, to study for that. For invitation tonight, I want to talk about the first six verses of uh, James chapter 4. The slide up there is the last verse that uh, we had in class tonight. And I said uh, earlier that I wanted to use that for the invitation, so that's why we didn't uh, 
get really into that. And I'm not going to read all six of these verses, but if you back up to verse 1 here at James chapter 4, James has addressed fights and quarrels uh, and the fact that they are caused by uh, a desire that wage war within us. And it causes us to fight, and he says it even causes us to commit murder. And so it's important that uh, we understand what he's saying. here. He calls friendship with the world uh, as being uh, adultery. It's a spiritual adultery. If you claim to be married to Christ and you still uh, have an affair with the world, then you commit spiritual adultery. That's what he's warning about. And we make ourselves enemies with God uh, when we choose that was, which is the antithesis of God. That is the opposite of God, the enemies of God. And so uh, James takes his language from God himself uh, through the prophets. In fact, what he says, says here in this text is from Hosea chapter 1 and verse 2. Go, many a promiscuous, go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. Uh, we turn over to the book of Mark, and he tells us in Mark 8 at verse 38 uh, that Jesus said, If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will shame, uh, be ashamed of, he, of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And then back to this text in James, it goes on to say that in spite of our spiritual adultery, in fact, that we have made mistakes, that we are flirting with the world and still claim to be married to Christ, we still are dependent upon the grace of God and His love and His mercy, His compassion uh, toward us. And while He opposes and resists the spiritual adultery, uh, He shows favor to those that are humble. And this is what He says at verse 6. But He gives more grace, therefore He says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He gives more grace. So grace wasn't just a one-time thing that God said and, and, and then concluded, well, that's it, I'm not giving any more. James tells us that, James, that God continues to abound in grace and extends it toward us. And that has to be beneficial for our salvation. And so in this concept this evening that we are dealing with as far as uh, obedience to the gospel of Christ is concerned in your own salvation, you have to know that God has done His part. He has extended His grace and continues, even after you become a Christian, to abound within you His grace and His mercy and His kindness and His love uh, so that you can walk in the straight and narrow, so that you can be righteous, and that you can have the hope of eternal life. And so the idea here is that we are able to repent and draw near to God for forgiveness. At verse 10 on down, I said the first six verses, but in the tenth verse, just to close this out, humble yourself before the Lord and He will lift you up. And that's what we're trying to encourage you to do this evening is to humble your heart before the Lord that He will lift you up. Humble yourself enough that you love Him and be obedient to His commands, that you would develop your faith into a confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, having repented of your sins, and then being willing to be baptized to come in contact with His precious redeeming blood. And hopefully then, you're an individual, and I ask Kevin to lead us particularly in this invitation song tonight, to tie in with the lesson we had in the auditorium, and to tie in with this James passage, uh, to encourage people to, that, to know that you have no better friend than Jesus. What a friend we have in Christ. And Ephesians 3 and verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by faith in Him. And that's an obedient faith. And we are encouraging, encouraging you tonight to practice that obedient faith and become a Christian. Will you come as together we stand and sing?
Appreciate Kevin leading that song this evening, and uh, I was standing up. Don't forget the radio program Sunday morning at 8.30 till 9, and then the uh, services here at Bible study at 9.45 and 10.30 and 6 o'clock. Anyone else? Let's bow our head, please, for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank Thee so much for being our Father, for sending Your Son, Jesus, as the Christ, for the Holy Spirit that works with our very lives each and every day that we might walk in the straight and narrow pathway of righteousness. We're thankful, Father, for this time that we have had together as brothers and sisters in Christ and those genuinely interested in studying thy will. 
We pray that we have rightly divided that word of truth and that the teachers and each student might have benefited from the inspiration of thy will. We pray for those that we have just mentioned as being sick and perhaps uh, others that we do not know about or uh, we failed to mention. We ask that you would put your loving arm of comfort and care around them and bring them back to their more normal portion of health. We pray for those who bereaved at this hour at the loss of loved ones. We pray that you will show them compassion and that they might rely upon their loved ones and their friends and their family for help. We pray for us all as we part one another from this place that you will watch over us and be with us and bring us back to the next appointed time. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.